Order members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on race equality. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Clerk. That this assembly recognises that the racial equality strategy 2015 to 2025 was not fully implemented and is now significantly outdated. Acknowledges the commitment contained in New Decade New Approach to the publication of a new and updated racial equality strategy within 100 days of the restoration of the Assembly. Further recognises the positive contribution made to society by those from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. De deplores the discrimination black, Asian and minority ethnic communities face regularly. Condemns racism in all its forms commits to act urgently on the forthcoming report on the review of hate crime legislation, calls for the promotion of an anti-racism ethos in our schools, and further calls on the executive to formulate and implement urgently a meaningful racial equality strategy. Thank you. And I call Emma Sheeran to formally move the motion. Oh, William Boggy, I'd like to move it. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. And I invite you to open the debate on the motion. I rise today to urge members to support this motion to send a clear and unequivocal message to the population of the North that racism is a scourge that the representatives in this chamber take seriously and will act with urgency to stamp out. Sinn Féin believe in a society that cherishes equality and respect as central tenets, a society free of discrimination in all its forms. This House must send a resounding signal that we have zero tolerance for racism here. We have brought this motion forward today to prioritise the updating and implementation of a racial equality strategy. In 2016, the UN Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination called on the executive of the day to adopt a comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation without further delay. Yet the racial equality strategy of 2015 has never been properly implemented. We need to acknowledge the blight of racism and the very real and lasting impact that it has on the lives of many within our community. Racism thrives where it is not challenged, where people turn a blind eye to insults and derogatory remarks. Violent attacks and vandalism are the symptoms. Hatred and intolerance are the cancer that cause them. Racism is not an arbitrary pie-in-the-sky notion that exists in books and films and stops there. It is 100% true that it should have been relegated to the dustbin of history long ago, and it wasn't right then either, but it hasn't been. It's something that impacts upon real people today. Families. Mothers, brothers, fathers, daughters. Growing up as an other or feeling the constant need to justify your identity is not acceptable in any 21st century society. And given the history of Ireland, it's certainly not acceptable here. Obviously, as recently as 2018, the British government themselves have exacerbated the hurt felt by the very people who they called upon to rebuild their country when they needed help by criminalising an entire generation of immigrants from the West Indies in a debacle that has now become known as the Windrush scandal. Racism, like any form of prejudice, is a mould. It grows under shadows, fed by hatred and intolerance, and curtained in a shroud of secrecy. It is only allowed to fester when it goes unchallenged. And as we are no strangers to in the north of Ireland, when discrimination becomes institutionalised, when it is practised by those who make and enforce the law, it is legitimised. In a year unlike any other, in the middle of a global pandemic, we watch the fallout of the deadly virus called racism in America, as the murder in cold blood of George Floyd on the street in Minneapolis played out on our televisions and our timelines. People took to the streets again. A few years ago, on a holiday in the deep south in America, I stood outside the Lorraine Motel and I felt the sadness of what had happened there overcome me. To think that the children and grandchildren of the Freedom Raiders, the marchers, 
The students who stage sit-ins in diners are still having to walk behind placards to be treated with decency and respect is beyond belief. It's shameful that in 2020, protest is still required for a life free of harassment and bullying because of the colour of your skin. We can dismiss this as something that happened far, far away across the Atlantic, but the reality is that racism is experienced every day on these shores as well. Countless accounts of members of the black and ethnic minority communities who have made their homes here told the same stories of verbal and physic physical abuse remarks and messages from behind a keyboard. In 2018, a Life and Times survey, in answer to the question about whether there was more racial prejudice in the North now than 40 years ago, 41% of respondents said more now. That's not acceptable. The European Court of Human Rights describes racial discrimination as a particularly insidious sign kind of discrimination. And in view of its consequences, they state that it requires from the authorities special vigilance and a vigorous reaction. Yet in the North, we have less protection for victims of racism than anywhere else in these islands. We need to address this. We need to see the implementation of stronger hate crime legislation, the report on which we await. This legislation must tackle institutional racism at its core and should be based on international best practice. It needs to be clear in people's minds that bullying on the basis of race is a crime that carries a penalty, something that is unacceptable before the law here. Supplementary to this, we require affirmative action to ensure proper representation of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities within our public sector and on the boards that make decisions. We should be, as part of this strategy, properly furnishing the groups who represent these communities with the resources that they require. There is an absence of ethnic monitoring, which means that we lack data relating to the presence of black and ethnic minorities in government and in industry. If you haven't got the full picture, it is difficult to address the issues. Much has been made in recent times about how this is a decade of centenaries. We're also in the middle of the UN decade of persons of Af African descent, something that we should be honouring within this chamber. What greater legacy could we have than to create a society where racism is nothing more than a horrible memory? For anyone who is brave enough to leave their home to make a life elsewhere, far from family and surroundings that they are used to, Ireland should be a warm and welcoming shore. We all have a duty to call out racism when we see it and act together to create a society built on justice and respect that treats everyone equally. We, as an executive, have to demonstrate that we have zero tolerance for racism here. One amendment has been uh, approved and is published on the Marshall's list, and I now invite uh, Paula Bradshaw to move, formally move the amendment. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to also moved to formally move it. Okay. Okay. I think you said moved. Yes. yes okay. I did. Thank you. <laughs> you will have ten minutes to uh, to uh, debate the amendment and a further five minutes to wind. I now invite you uh, to open the debate on the amendment. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to propose the Alliance Party amendment to the motion, but I thank the members of Sinn Féin for bringing forward this important subject for debate today. I represent the South Belfast constituency, noted as the most culturally, ethnically and socially diverse constituency in Northern Ireland, and it is this diversity that makes it all the more enriched and prosperous in all senses of the word. The frustration, therefore, for many, not least the minority ethnic community, is that the issue of race relations does not appear to receive the attention and concentration of effort that it deserves and requires. As such, our amendment is to provide a mechanism for fully engaging and drawing on the lived experience of the BAME community to co-design and co-produce an updated race relations strategy for Northern Ireland. Their input will not only provide space to make the amended strategy more closely linked to the issues faced, but will also ensure greater buy-in from this diverse community. The premise for wide and authentic co-design and co-production is that firstly, we have the identification of all the problems and solutions. Then we ensure that we translate the solutions into firm actions, outputs and outcomes. This is where I feel that the current strategy from the Executive Office is light on detail and needs to go further and be more ambitious. And that is why I'm calling for an update as opposed to a replacement. 
Our amendment also calls for a timetable for this work to be completed and, more importantly, implemented. The BIME community has been raising concerns for many years, not least at the lack of the sense of urgency in addressing the issues they face in many aspects of their lives. To address the substance of the motion, I very much welcomed the inclusion of the, in the new decade, new approach agreement, the need to produce a new and updated strategy within 20, or sorry, 100 days. To be fair to the Executive Office, nobody in January could have predicted that our lives and the work of this Assembly would be so significantly disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, it is entirely reasonable and understandable that this target of 100 days may have slipped. However, it is now time for this work to recommence. And so moving on from here today, while it is important that the Executive Office leads on this work with full engagement from the BAME, BAME community and other voluntary sector stakeholders, it is also vital that, uh, that there is cross-departmental feed-in to this strategy and in turn complete cooperation in terms of the agreed actions and their timeframes for implementation. This departmental cooperation will be vital to ensure that existing and forth uh, forthcoming work complements the content and aspirations of the race relations strategy and this will make this will require some work in terms of assimilation and coordination but it is very much necessary the next stage from this will be the requirement that sufficient funding is allocated so that the actions can be fully delivered in a timely fashion where there is cross departmental working required it is absolutely vital that there is agreement from the start that the collaboration is forthcoming and not wrangled, especially as regards financing, which we in this chamber know has been the reason why many a fine project has not gotten off the ground. <coughs> Further to this, I have met with numerous voluntary sector groups, especially in my constituency, who are doing the most amazing work with ethnic minority communities from origins all over the world, from all parts of the world, and yet they are operating on an absolute shoestring um, with stressful levels of funding, uncertainty and risk. If we are serious about empowering and integrating people who choose to live here, then we have to properly support those groups who have the connections, understanding and ability to properly engage with them. Taking forward the themes of empowering and integrating people, we need to ensure that members of the BAME community are educated about all aspects of our public services, with particular reference to providing them with an understanding of the standards of support and duty of care that they should expect, and in turn equipping them with um, the power to stand up and speak out for these rights. As regards integrating, we know that individuals and families are coming to Northern Ireland to settle here for many years, decades and even centuries. And it has long since gone time that we remove some barriers to their full assimilation into life here in our schools, workplaces and community life in general. On this, it is equally important that we put in place measures to ensure that this integration is not blocked nor frustrated by others through covert or overt racism and in extreme cases, hate crime. And I very much work, uh, welcome the ongoing work in the Justice Department into the review of hate crime legislation. It is this type of robust work that needs to be replicated across many departments to ensure that the relevant legislative framework is fit for purpose. There may also be measures required in addressing educational achievement amongst BAME pupils, which can be the result of, or at least um, partway perpetuated by bullying and marginalisation in our schools. As such, there may be the need to produce anti-racism or update ant existing anti-bullying policies to reflect, reflect the needs of these pupils in securing appropriate support. Another key area that I feel that the race relations strategy has a huge role to play is in the workplace. From the time of recruitment processes in terms of fair employment through to access to training and promotional opportunities, it is in everyone's interest that the legislative and policy frameworks are workable and effective in ensuring harmony and integration for all BAME employees. In closing, um, Mr Speaker, I hope MLAs here today can support our amendment and I would like to place on record my thanks for those groups and individuals who have worked so hard over the years at campaigning for the rights of BAME members of our society. Their efforts are very much appreciated and welcomed by the Alliance Party. Lastly, I wish to send my best wishes to those members of the British, sorry, the Belfast Multicultural Association whose cars were damaged at the weekend. If ever there was a stark reminder that we need a fresh look at race relations here in Northern Ireland, it was this. Thank you.
Members and all other speakers, in this debate we'll have up to five minutes. I call George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I do not believe that any MLA would support anything but racial equality and condemn all racial attacks in Northern Ireland from whatever quarter that it came from. We must also remember that while the motion states that, and I quote, the Racial Equality Strategy 2015-2025 is outdated, progress was prevented as the Assembly was not sitting and dealing with this matter in a timely manner for three years. It is important that the strategy is moved forward, and this must be done with care to ensure whatever decisions are made are practical and, most importantly, workable. While I appreciate that speed is desired, it is, not, it is better to ensure a practical and workable strategy. I fully believe that an interdepartmental approach is required, and I am glad that there is a racial equality champion in every department. I also see benefit from each department's observations being brought to an interdepartmental forum, so best practice can be seen to be the result. Speed is not the most important aspect. Accuracy is. Any conclusions must be informed by the ethnic minorities. This is a positive way to produce the best possible strategy, fully informed by those it is intended to help. A good example of best practice for greatest results, which will be truly beneficial. As I said earlier, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I fully support the need for the racial equality strategies to be completed and implemented. But this must be a workable strategy with genuine beneficial results for Northern Ireland and the increasingly multi-racial population, which we should all embrace. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I welcome this debate today because I think it is timely. Uh, we have seen over the summer in places like America some of the most atrocious behaviours from those that are meant to uphold and protect the law against those that should be protected. And it would not be an underestimate, an understatement, to say that in places like America, racism still remains and is not on the decrease. However, to simply look at such a splinter without acknowledging the plank in our own eye is wrong. We have racism in our society. The things that are said and done, the things that aren't said and aren't done, and the things that are said and done and left unchecked. These are all existing in our society, and we have not yet successfully challenged or removed them. The scourge remains among us. Now, many lauded the launch by the First and Deputy First Minister of the Racial Equality Strategy here in 2015. It was a comprehensive document and contained 11 key actions. Sadly, many of them have never been introduced or developed. This is sad and an indictment of where this executive and to a lesser extent or sorry to where that executive and to a lesser extent this executive places the challenging of racism. These matters contained in the racial equality strategy of 2015 to 2025 are as relevant now, this second, this minute, this hour. The strategy does not suffer from being outdated. It suffers from never being implemented. Would members consider a review of the current Race Relations Northern Ireland order significantly outdated? That piece of legislation has not been touched for eight years. Surely that legislation requires a review. It is, uh, is it outdated to seek a review of fair employment legislation? What about working with the Department of Education to tackle racist bullying in schools? We have anti-bullying legislation which the Minister has yet to reenact. However, this legislation places the onus entirely on schools to record and monitor without having to actually report back to the Department, so we don't get a wider picture of what racial bullying actually looks like. Ethnic monitoring. This is such a huge element within the strategy. However, it drastically needs to be introduced. Without any form of ethnic monitoring, we will be searching for a solution to an issue that we do not even have the full picture of. There will be a new census taken next year, and at present there are 16 ethnic groups to choose from. 
with titles as generic as African, yet there are literally thousands of ethnic groups and cultures in Africa, yet there are, um, how on earth do we expect to gauge the needs of the people who live here if we don't know where they are? Racial equality champions, that's something that I've been asking all ministers about, about the champion raising the awareness of the racial equality strategy and department's commitment to it. The authors and contributors and ministers lauding the strategy then knew what they were challenging was so deep-rooted and so systemic that it was going to take time to challenge. That is why the strategy was set for 10 years, a generation nearly of schoolchildren and wider society that could learn the benefits of a multicultural society where all are accepted regardless of their backgrounds or beliefs, their colour or their creed. The only outdated action is the lack of action that has been taken to implement that strategy. Now, the passage of time means that all strategies should be reviewed and assessed, and having a living document is uh, much more preferable. And I'm not under any illusion that the current strategy does need some amendment. But I would like to see more concrete outcomes, more measurable activity to observe how it's been implemented, to make sure that we can see progress. Although some of the activities from the summer will have sparked new thoughts and new ideas and new approaches, these can also be incorporated into the strategy. But it isn't substantially out of date. This doesn't require renewed formulations. All the ingredients are there. It needs action, not more discussion. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to highlight that the party that's proposing this motion today, highlighting the inactivity and suggesting that the strategy is out of date, is the very party that launched the existing one five years ago and then oversaw no implementation and co-contributed to three years of inactivity here on the Hill and has been back in charge since January. I think that there Member is George more headline Marshall, chasing please. here than substance. Many in the sector think that if what we have is grand, let's implement it alongside a review and polish up what we have. People want action, I want action, and getting on will deliver action. Let's do the right thing. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, and I rise um, to address this important uh, motion uh, and, in doing so, uh, support it. I, I shall keep my comments, I think, uh, quite general, um, uh, as opposed to maybe getting into some of the detail due to time. The very fact that we are still talking about discrimination due to somebody's colour or ethnic background uh, is really quite depressing. Um, dealing with it is, is long overdue. I simply cannot fathom why some individuals within our society feel they have a right to treat their fellow human being in such a derogatory way through intimidation, discrimination, threats of violence and violence based purely on the colour of their skin. Of course, these same people will argue uh, a variety of reasons for their bigotry and will use the terms like, I have black friends. But the reality is, if you treat someone differently purely because of the colour of their skin, ethnic background, you are a racist. And you are in denial if you say you are not. I have been very lucky in my life, uh, is that I have lived in many different countries uh, around the world and spent a lot of time uh, in Africa, in Uganda, in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, in Somalia. And while I was there, I immersed, immersed myself in the culture that was there. Wonderful, rich cultures, wonderful, rich people, giving people. It has broadened my horizons. It has given me a wider left and right of art to understand why they may come to here to wish to eke out a better life than where they have in some other parts of the world. It has allowed me to see people as people because that is exactly what they are, nothing more, nothing less. Within Northern Ireland, the black, Asian and ethnic minorities work in our factories, in our shops, garages, in our hospitality sector. They're in our care homes. They're in our hospitals. They are paramedics. They are clinical and non-clinical staff. They are doctors. They are surgeons. And without them, we would be a poorer place. So therefore, we need to ensure that our black, Asian and ethnic minorities are valued, cherished, supported 
and protected. We need to do this through legislation, through a racial equalities strategy and anti-racism ESOFs, through education and through civic society with better understanding. We must address it through our justice system, and I am disheartened that we are not doing more. But to do that, we need data to inform any strategy. And the final draft report on review of ethnic monitor monitoring gave a list of recommendations, including appointing an independent advisor on race equality, setting up an ethnic monitoring unit, extending fair employment legislation, enacting a public sector equality duty. It's not hard to do. It will take a resource. It will take money. But it is the right thing to do. There is no place for racism in Northern Ireland. There never was. There never is. There never will be. It is important to future-proof our society and put a firewall in place between our young people and racism. This is not just for the executive office. This is a cross-cutting where all departments have a part to play in this. It's as much an issue for justice and the economy and education as it is for the executive office. There is no point trying to package this in one place. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody needs to take ownership. Everybody needs to be a part of this. Uh, we will be supporting the motion. I call Christopher Stulford. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, much like Mr McGrath, the one element of the motion that I disagree with is the reference to the strategy being significantly outdated. The strategy was put in place for the period 2015 to 2025, and we're here in 2020. I think you can probably say, OK, we know things now that we didn't know in 2015 that we should maybe include in the strategy. But I don't think it's fair to say that it's significantly outdated. And like Mr McGrath, uh, I would point out that we were without a government uh, for a period of time, and I don't wish to rehearse the reasons for that. Uh, I represent, and I'm privileged to represent, the constituency that I was born and reared in, in South Belfast. It is a very diverse and a cosmopolitan constituency, and it has always been thus. Much like the rest of Northern Ireland, South Belfast has always been a welcoming place from pe for people from beyond our shores. If we go back on a Northern Ireland level, 70 years ago, lots of Italian people came here in the immediate aftermath of World War II to make their home. 50 years ago, or 60 years ago, I suppose now, 1960, early 60s, it was people from an Indian and a Chinese background who came here and put down roots. And in my constituency, I'm very proud of those communities and the contribution that they make to our society. These are people who came to Northern Ireland and invested in Northern Ireland at a time when nobody else wanted to, because we were thought of as, <laughs> frankly, a hellhole on the edge of Europe that no one wanted to be in. But these people came and made a contribution to our society. Children aren't taught, or sorry, children don't naturally hate. They have to be taught it. And I'm a father of four young children, three of which are at primary school. And I see, for example, the school that I went to, Nettlefield Primary School, at the bottom of the Woodstock Road. When I went there, there would have been very, very few people from a, a different background, whether it was from Eastern Europe or Africa or anywhere else. There's now probably about 25 languages spoken in the school. Fane Street Primary School, as my, my colleague can attest, uh, Paula Bradshaw can attest, I suspect it's probably more than 50. Botanic Primary School is the same. So I represent a, a very, very diverse constituency. But as the father of young children, you see the children play peaceably, happily together. They have to be taught to hate. And I think it's important, therefore, that we recognise the contribution that schools are already making to ensuring the children grow up respecting each other, loving each other, and being kind and decent with each other 
and certainly the school that my children attend, where I have you know, a daughter with her best friends from Romania and her other friends from Estonia in the same class. And you see the contribution that the schools make to fostering a spirit of togetherness amongst the children. So I absolutely accept the reference to schools and why that's important. All I'm saying is that there's already important work going on, uh, orchestrated by schools. I think co-design in any strategy going forward is a really important principle. We do not have the lived experience of people who have travelled here to make their home. We can never have that lived experience. Most of us, I think all of us in this room certainly, were born here and we have known nothing else. And therefore, the significant obstacles and challenges that people face when they come here to build a new life for themselves and uh, to make a contribution to our society. Those challenges, especially if you're thinking about things like getting access to healthcare, getting access to education for their kids, getting access to uh, social services or benefits, all of those things that people who were born here know inside out, those people don't know that. So help needs to be given there and assistance. And so I think it's really important that let's not throw the baby out. I will. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there is good work that the executive can point to, but of course we can always do better. Thank you. I call Linda Dillon. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The stats highlight clearly the increase in the number of hate-related crimes and racially motivated attacks. And that's extremely concerning, particularly given that we're all well aware that many incidents and crimes in this category go unreported for many reasons, including language and cultural barriers, but also due to the fear of reprisal, especially where there is concern that there may be paramilitary involvement. A 2018 policing board report found that some victims suggested that PSNA officers had assessed their credibility based on negative stereotyping and whilst paramilitary groups targeting minority ethnic communities has been evidenced, no joint strategy appears to have been put in place to tackle this. Current legislation in the North is failing victims, as highlighted by the previous DPP, Barr McGrory, when he stated there is no easy opportunity to identify the race element in court. It's the law, it's the way it's, it is framed, and certainly the policymakers and lawmakers on these issues may want to revisit this. And I would pick up on, on Doug Beattie and others in relation to that, that we have many departments that need to take responsibility here, including justice. These crimes currently come under the Public Order Act 1987, which does not meet the stipulations of international human rights standards. There needs to be serious consideration given to a restorative approach post-conviction or incarceration, as this will assist in reconciliation and meaningful rehabilitation, as imprisonment alone will often not address the underlying issue. Any restorative approach must be victim-led and voluntary, but I think it is a very important part of the approach because that is what will actually lead to real and meaningful reconciliation, as we well know from our, our own lived experience here. We need laws that properly meet the needs of victims but as a community, and we in particular as leaders in our community, need to have a zero-tolerance zero approach to racism in all of its forms. The best way to protect ethnic, ethnic minority groups from attacks is by ensuring that they're not seen as isolated or vulnerable. And the way to do that is to ensure that we all, as individuals, reach out to our neighbours and those in our constituencies who may fall into these categories. It's not good enough to stand back or to put a, a statement out and say this is terrible, what has happened to, to a person that lives near me or in my constituency is, is terrible. We have to be seen to be standing with those people. We have to be seen to be reaching out to our neighbours. We have to be seen to let, let our children play with those children because too often you see it's easier just not to because they speak a different language and there's all kinds of barriers. If you have children who live near children of other backgrounds culturally, you should be encouraging your children to embrace that diversity. It, as has already been said here by, by Mr Stalford, 
It's really, really important. No child is born to hate. They learn it. So what we need to do is teach them differently. And we as parents, we as leaders, all have responsibility around that. So I thank this motion for coming forward and support the amendment. I call Martina Anderson. You know, it is a sad indictment on our society that in this day and age we need to call for the full implementation of a racial equality strategy, but unfortunately we do. We know that from the 2018 Life and Time survey that a significant group in the North are intolerant of people who they don't want as neither a friend or a neighbour. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the colour of their skin or their background or their religion. People must learn to hate. Children are not born hating, as has been said. They learn hate from within their peer groups, their communities, and sadly, sometimes within their own homes. Prejudice is a blight in our society that needs tackled, and a good starting point would be to address it within our schools and our education curriculum. Schools are one of our children's earliest learning experience, so we need to teach them that based on our common humanity, we are all equal, no matter the colour of our skin, our background, or religion. Thankfully, many schools now include new nationals. So schools must adopt an anti-racist ethos that practices that will stamp out racism whenever it raises its ugly head. This could be advanced through enhanced teacher training to support them when dealing with children who suffer racist bullying. Confronted, confronting narrow-mindedness, developing inclusive processes and procedures which include ethnic minority children, teaching children that all human beings are born equal could reduce racism in the future. Of course, it's not only schools that need to stamp out racism. This assembly needs to step up to the plate by advancing, and as was evidenced by my, my party colleague, Linda Dillon, who highlighted the impact of legislative failure. Previously, I put questions to the SDLP Minister for Infrastructure, Nicola Mallon, about the legality of TransLink facilitating the targeting of people on the basis of the colour or ethnicity on cross-border transport services. It is just wrong that the colour of someone's skin or their appearance. Just as a point of information, does she have uh, which particular evidence is she talking about about TransLink staff stopping members of the public? It would just be helpful if she could clarify exactly what she's talking about. Transport facilitating buses being stopped and people being taken off the bus because of the colour of their skin. And it is wrong that the colour of someone's skin or their appearance can determine if they are singled out on a bus full of people. This is not equality, and as has been said by the chair of the, the SDLP chair of the TEO committee, we can't have things done and left unchecked. We need mandatory ethnic mo mo uh, monitoring of how stop and search powers are being used. The powers of law enforcement officers to stop persons and seek papers confirming their identity and status is clearly provided for by law. To our new nationals, Sinn Féin say to you, Cade Mila Falsha, a hundred thousand welcomes. And we will do all within our power to protect you, particularly from abuse, racially motivated intimidation, violence and discrimination. As political leaders, we have a duty to send out a strong message to everyone within our society that racism is a cancer that we will not tolerate. An important first step, as this mo motion points out, is for this Assembly and Executive to ensure that we have a robust racial equality strategy accompanied by an action plan which clearly sets out steps we will take both legislatively and legally to protect everyone within our society. As our Joint First Minister Michelle O'Neill stated today, there is a responsibility on us all 
to create a society free from racism, which values diversity and which treats everyone with respect. As a Sinn Féin MLA for Derry, I want the North West Migrant Forum to once again hear that Sinn Féin message loud and clear. If anyone or any party in this Assembly or Executive is an obstacle to that, then let's find out and let's call them out. Go Thank you all. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm now the third member of the Assembly for South Belfast to stand up and speak to this motion. And that's appropriate. And I will echo a lot of what both uh, Paula Bradshaw and Christopher Stalford said about the constituency of South Belfast. It's not only the most diverse in Northern Ireland, it has some claim to be the most diverse in the whole, on the whole island of Ireland. And we are rightly proud of that. It adds to the richness of our community. It is uh, important for our, uh, for, it adds to the economic vibrancy and the cultural vibrancy of the place we live. This year, we have all been focused in large part uh, to a much greater extent on deep structural questions around uh, structural racism and racial inequality in our societies. This was first, uh, or first this year, um, brought to, um, forced into the public debate by the appalling murder of George Floyd and the um, protests that followed in the States. Like Emma Shear and I visited the deep south of the United States, and it's difficult to visit that part of America without being deeply affected by the deep, by the burning sense of profound historical injustice and unresolved wrong that continues to afflict that part of the United States. And it's not irrelevant to this part of the world. It isn't, uh, it isn't something that we can. Um, ignore in our own society, not just because, as I said about South Belfast, our society is becoming more diverse. So there is no, I think, real difference in this assembly about the importance and urgency of addressing structural racism in our society. This morning we had a debate on uh, one of our own long-standing uh, pet preoccupations in this part of the world, that of flags and associated questions of identity in this part of Ireland. Well. Those kinds of debates and our um, tendency to have quite a few of them in this place, and that's not to, to say that there weren't aspects of this morning's debate that weren't important, does tend to alienate many of the people from newer communities in Northern Ireland who think that these institutions don't do enough to reflect the fact that we don't exist any longer in a green-orange binary society and that there are very real, very profound uh, injustices that they face in their everyday lives and in the economic um, uh, opportunities that they have and in the opportunities that their families have. Um, the meat of the motion is about reflecting the fact that we need a new racial equality strategy because the previous uh, one was not fully implemented. As my colleague Colin McGrath said, um, we can't completely ignore the reasons for that um, uh, racial equality strategy not being implemented and why we were not here to implement it. I don't have uh, any problem with the context of the racial equality strategy being reviewed. In fact, I think it's essential. So in that part, I completely agree with the motion. There is concern within the sector about um, taking time to go away and redraft an entirely new strategy um, at a time when um, there is a huge amount of urgency in terms of implementing what was agreed in 2014 but left on a shelf. So what this motion should not be is permission for our institutions, our executive, to go away and uh, delay implementing what's already been agreed, including some of the, the things that Linda Dillon was very eloquently talking about around hate crime legislation. Given that we know those uh, are things that we need to be implementing, we should just get ahead and do it. But it is also the case that the context has changed since 2014. Um, we all, the context has changed since this January when we came back to this place. Uh, yes, because of COVID-19, but also because of some of the circumstances around Brexit. Brexit will fundamentally alter not just our economic relationships, but also the, uh, under, the, the constitutional and legal underpinnings for the broader human rights agenda in Northern Ireland. There, are a, there is a very long list of unanswered questions that the British government has failed to engage on that, we, that is uh, directly relevant to how 
we proceed in terms of uh, equality legislation and the broader racial equality strategy here. Um, there are specific things we need to improve in terms of the implementation of the existing strategy around budgets, around meaningful accountability. And if today's debate does anything, let it do this. Let it not be the last time we discuss this for months until we come back for a private member's motion and, and, and an amendment to it. Let us keep up the pressure. Let's keep talking about whether this is being delivered. And let's hold those uh, to account who said they were going to deliver this strategy. Uh, let's hold them to account for actually delivering it. So, yes, uh, I want to see a new focus on delivering uh, racial equality in this society, but no, I don't just want to see us spending time, uh, the time debating the, 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 the term, you know, debating the what we already should be getting with implementing. Up. Thanks. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and yet, I'll be the fourth South Belfast MLA then to stand up. So it's great to see all my South Belfast colleagues here today. Um, and obviously, proud to take the, the shout out for the most diverse constituency across across the land. And I know for a fact, well, I would be pretty confident, sorry, that Deirdre Hargy, um, as the fifth MLA for the area, would be here today if her health allowed her. Um, but I'm also. Um, part of the Italian immigration story that was referenced by my colleague Christopher Salford. Um, and my family are all integrated education alumni, um, and there were 27 languages spoken in my children's primary school. All these reasons were part of the reasons I chose the school, but this motion really does confuse me. Um, and many have pointed out already the problems with it. Um, and it states that this assembly recognises that the racial equality strategy 2015 to 2025 was not fully implemented and is now significantly outdated. So unless I'm mistaken, we are only in 2020. Um, and there are five years in which we can rectify that um, and have a look at what we do need to do. Now, let's be real. This strategy, like every other executive strategy, is only as good as the political will to implement it. I, ha I have consulted with some of the black and ethnic minority community leaders um, over the past few days, and they, like me, believe that the strategy continues to be very much serviceable. It's the implementation, or the lack of, where the problem lies. Do we really have the resources to develop a whole new strategy when the current one hasn't been delivered or implemented? What is needed are action plans and resources to implement the undelivered 11 key actions already committed to in the current strategy, along with an anti-racism strategy that will be resourced as well. One key action in the racial equality strategy is the establishment of a ministerial panel, for example. That's not been done. So what has been done with regards to racial equality since January 2020, when the Assembly was reconvened? I know of only two of the key actions that have been implemented, and that was the appointment of department champions, for which we have no updates or ongoing works for, or know nothing about the training and resource given to them. And the subgroup has been established. Um, and while the, yep, sure. Do you agree with me that it's not good that those 11 are those uh, departmental champions? As I understand it, there's only one that has actually been there from the strategy started in 2015. The rest have continually turned over, and that they've had one training session in five years. And that if we talk about things being outdated, it's getting those people in their room to find out what they can actually do within a department. The members an extra minute. Thank you. And I think that comes back again to, you know, a strategy is only as good as the political will to implement it. Um, yep, so there's lots to still do, but the subgroup, the subgroup has been established. They do meet regularly. They do meet quarterly. And I think that it's uh, sad that they probably weren't even consulted on for this debate uh, before it was lodged. Um, but I believe the Commission in a new strategy, strategy could be quite regressive and um, move to delay us really tackling the racial inequalities that do exist. And I think our time would be better spent reviewing and resourcing the current strategy as it is and developing and rolling out anti-racism training, which is absolutely key for us all to learn about tackling racism in our society. So there's much, there is a need for much more significant staff resources and funding to be dedicated to tackling racism, and this needs to be for a long term. 
The Northern Ireland Assembly must renew its commitment to building a society where racial equality and diversity is supported, understood, valued and respected, where people of minority ethnic backgrounds have a sense of belonging, which is acknowledged and valued by people from all backgrounds. Um, which is acknowledged, or sorry, and as outlined in the strategy to ensure accountability for its implementation. And while working hand in hand with the current subgroup um, and using their expertise to move us forward. And I think it's shocking to realise that while um, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, we know that a lot of our BME community are um, key workers through this crisis as well, and shocking to realise that those same people would appear to have suffered disproportionately during this crisis because of the inequalities and the further barriers that they suffer in our society. So tackling these inequalities must be a priority. We must be prepared to learn from their experience, um, but we have very limited time. The BME community um, have been really patient enough um, and with us, and we must act resolutely to ensure that our young people have the opportunities they need and they deserve. But today's debate, regardless of any majority vote in the end, will carry no sway in mandating the Executive Office to deliver, to deliver on either the current or any future strategies. But what it has allowed for um, has been the acknowledgement that to date, we have failed to fully protect and remove barriers to full participation for our BME um, population. And the fact that I am a white woman speaking to a room of other white people has also not been lost on me. We have much to the do. Remarks to close. Yeah, we have much to do to, and a lot to get done. But let us not rely on already asking under-resourced and under-pressured organisations to do that work for us. Let us today pledge to review, implement and resource the next five years to make the world an easier place for our new communities. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. First of all, this chamber should commend the black and ethnic minority-led groups who initiated the proposal uh, to bring forward this urgent discussion and a call for action uh, on racial equality uh, to the Assembly. It is very unfortunate that the BAME community felt it necessary to register their disappointment at the lack of political will to tackle racial inequalities here, uh, and it is indeed a, a matter of profound disappointment and something that the executive, frankly, should be ashamed of. Uh, this is another example of parties, in my view, hypocritically saying one thing and doing another, or in this case, doing nothing. And yet there are some who claim that there is no structural racism here in the North. The letter from the BAME community was uh, prompted by the horrific murder of George Floyd. And some might say, I think even some in this chamber previously did say, that that's something happening very far from here. Yet we have the embarrassing spectacle uh, of DUP MPs enthusiastically uh, proclaiming their support for President uh, Donald Trump, the tyrant in the White House who has defended the murder of black people by police in the US and given encouragement and protection to racist vigilantes who have killed Black Lives Matter protesters. The letter from the BAME community calls for the Assembly to ensure people from minority ethnic backgrounds living here uh, could not be treated as lesser uh, human beings and for the necessary resources to be put in place for a genuine racial equality strategy to be implemented. This needs to be done immediately. Uh, people for profit, Mr Deputy Speaker, heed the call from this community uh, to support this motion. Um, we will be giving it our, our support, uh, full support today. We do not just want to see it passed. We want to see it implemented in full, with the full participation of the, of the BAME uh, community. We need to fire up the effort to eradicate racism from every aspect of our society. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we submitted an amendment to the motion in front of us today that was unfortunately uh, not accepted. The amendment seeked uh, for the Assembly to support uh, the call for all, all the fines and the threats of prosecution to those who attended and organised the socially distanced Black Lives Matter rallies in Belfast and Derry uh, on June the 6th to be dropped. As everyone in this chamber knows, the health guidelines have been breached by many events uh, in many ways during the pandemic. However, it was the only the Black Lives Matter protests that, unlike all the other events, were organised uh, in the safest possibly socially distant way with masks, sanitizer, and gloves. It is only the Black Lives Matter protests and protesters that have been system systematically criminalised. I repeat, the Black Lives Matter protesters were systematically criminalised. 
Therefore, the way in which Black Lives Matter organisers and protesters were treated is a blatant example of institutionalised uh, racism. Members of the black and ethnic minority community were visited in their homes the night before the protests and threatened with prosecution by the PSNI. What a disgraceful matter refers. On the day of the protests, people of co colour and many attending uh, or attempting to attend the protests were harassed as well by the PSNI. Uh, I will take a point, yeah. To the member. I hope that the member will recall the debate that there was in this House on the issues of the breaches of the health regulations that took place at Milltown Cemetery. And I hope that he will recall that on that occasion, I myself also highlighted the discrepancy in treatment between people taking part in one event and people taking part in a Black Lives Matter event as well. Members, an extra minute. I'm sure you did. Uh, but, I mean, where was the police visits for people who run care homes where there's been outbreaks of COVID-19? Where was the police calls on workplaces where there's been health and safety um, issues raised about COVID-19? If you can't see that, member, then oh, sorry, I can't, uh, I can't help you there. Uh, and I think for this to be uh, carried out the way these protesters were treated, um, legislation had to be undemocratically rushed through this assembly. This is a blatant example of institutionalised racism and it appears to be com completely lost on some in this House and it appears to be the member uh, from South Belfast as well. Um, the Justice Minister and all those who uh, stood over, voted for, defended uh, what occurred on June 6, um, say they're not racist, say we support civil rights, say we support racial equality, but they didn't do it on June 6. And the failure to recognise institutional racism doesn't stop here. In City Council, uh, parties claim to support civil rights and racial equality and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, some of them didn't support a, a motion brought by my party uh, to drop the fines uh, and prosecutions, the threats of prosecutions on June 6. Shocking, really, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. And here's the point of all this. The Assembly has voted for the past for a racial equality strategy, but did nothing to seriously implement it. Now we have the danger of more possibly lofty gestures, but still a refusal to acknowledge institutional racism towards the Black Lives Matter movement. This is called hypocrisy. And even the dogs in the street are barking about it. So we call Mr Deputy Speaker and all members of the Assembly to vote for the motion, vote in favour of the motion, discussed as a way of um, fully acknowledge, acknowledging structural and institutional racism in our society and the need to act in order to eradicate it. We also call members to uh, fully take on board the demands of the BAME community. We also call for the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, fines and threats of prosecution to be dropped immediately and for a sincere apology to be issued to that community for, the, for their treatment. Thank you. I now call on the junior minister, Gordon Lyons, to respond to the debate and you'll have up to 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to respond to some of the concerns um, of members that have been expressed uh, in regards to the current position of the Executive's racial equality strategy. I want to reassure the House that addressing the needs of all of our minority ethnic communities in Northern Ireland is a particularly important matter for us, and one which has and will continue to be a priority. As the Executive's Racial Equality Strategy 2015 to 2025 acknowledged, we are under no illusion about the size of the challenge involved in tackling racial inequalities, and that will require time, effort and resources. Mr Beatty said during his remarks that this should be a cross-departmental issue, and of course um, it will be. But additionally, we have to recognise, and indeed our strategy recognises, that each and every one of us has a responsibility to play our part in combating racism and racial inequalities. Success requires the support and active participation of all sections of society and not government alone. The strategy does, however, establish a framework for action for the Northern Ireland Executive and commits to 11 key actions. And good progress has been made to date in implementing these key actions. And I want to highlight these now. Uh, specifically, uh, the structures to support delivery, including the racial equality subgroup to act as the voice of minority ethnic people, and racial equality champions in each department. They are both uh, in place. Work on developing uh, a joint work programme and approach is ongoing, as the subgroup have been exploring ways to work and to make best use of the connections with the champions. 
The Department engages regularly with the Racial Equality Subgroup and its members, along with representatives from a broad range of organisations representing minority ethnic groups. Additionally, a review of the Race Relations Northern Ireland Order and relevant aspects of other legislation is underway. And research into ethnic, minor ethnic monitoring, which also includes the potential for amendments to our fair employment legislation, has just been compl completed. Ethnic, minor ethnic monitoring can be defined as the process used to collect, store and analyse data about people's ethnic background. And this system is critical to achieving racial equality, monitoring service usage and ensuring that services are meeting users' needs. Without this monitoring, government, departments and agencies will find it difficult to identify gaps and monitor whether racial equality work is having any impact. The Racial Equality Subgroup has been engaged to inform the final research report which we expect to receive in the coming weeks. It will be used to develop future proposals and we will want to engage with other departments and agencies to explore the possible and most appropriate options for implementation. There is growing evidence of a disproportionately high number of BAME deaths from COVID-19 in England and Wales and we understand that work is ongoing with the Department of Health to examine the situation here. This ex I'll give way to the member. Thank you very much. We, 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 you've mentioned um, twice the racial equality subgroup, which is supposed to operate under the auspices of a ministerial subgroup. Would you agree with me that the, an early appointment of that ministerial subgroup would be really useful to help garnish the views that are being made and then pass that through to the various departments to help them uh, reflect and change anything that needs to be done? Well, as part of the, the monitoring of what is, what is taking place and how we can best hope to implement the, the strategy, that, is, that of course is something is, that we can uh, consider and appreciate the member uh, raising that, uh, that point with me. Um, I was uh, referring there to the uh, BAME deaths uh, in England and um, this example reinforces uh, the need for reliable evidence gathering to fully uh, identify the extent of racial inequalities uh, across uh, the board and our work on ethnic monitoring will support the establishment of an improved evidence base. A review of the delivery model for the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, a key element of our policy for supporting racial equality and good race relations, has also just completed and we expect again a report, uh, a final report in the next few weeks and the findings will inform the future operation of the fund. We are also working with the Department of Education to identify ways to tackle racist bullying in schools and this is supported again by the Racial Equality Subgroup who are also engaging with the PSNI to agree actions uh, to increase identification and monitoring of race hate crime. A draft refugee integration strategy for all refugees and asylum seekers is being finalised and we hope to publish this for consultation later this year. This is of the utmost importance at this time, particularly given the increase in those seeking asylum here over the last number of years and we have drawn on the learning and best practice from our work with the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme uh, which will help us to inform the development of that strategy. Indeed, the uh, Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme is a shining example of successful cooperation and collaboration across government departments, agencies, local councils and the community to achieve results which really improve people's lives. To date, we have successfully welcomed 1,815 individuals here and are committed to the continuation of what is, not, what is now known as the Global Resettlement Scheme. The work carried out by the Executive and all partners on making this scheme a success is central to what underpins the racial equality strategy, all sectors working together to tackle racial inequalities. This work has been widely recognised as best practice and provides a model for approaches to addressing other areas of racial equality and marginalised communities. For example, it is planned to extend the remit of the current structures overseeing uh, the Syrian uh, VPRS to deal with the issues faced by asylum seekers who come here outside of a formal scheme. The Racial Equality Indicators Baseline Report was published in November 2018 and presents data measuring the progress uh, of the racial equality strategy. And we are pleased that the report shows headway made in a number 
of areas. Notably, it shows that there has been a significant decrease in the proportion of respondents reporting they are prejudiced against people from minority ethnic communities. In 2014, uh, that was 24.8%. In 2017, at 19.7%. We do, however, uh, of course appreciate that there is more to do, and we will continue to work to fully implement the actions in the strategy. At this juncture, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight that the racial equality strategy is a 10-year strategy, of which we are, of course, in year five. Uh, it was never meant to be that the strategy would be fully implemented at this stage, and we have a number of key actions ongoing and at critical stages, as already highlighted. We believe these actions remain important in our efforts to address racism and inequality and ensure people of all backgrounds and ethnicities can participate equally in society. We therefore remain very much committed to seeing them through to completion. I would acknowledge the reference to the racial equality strategy amongst a list of other strategies in the New Decade New Approach document. This is in the context of the programme for government and strategies which could underpin it. While there was an action in NDNA to publish a new comprehensive timetable within three months for the development and delivery of the strategies necessary to achieve the outcomes of the programme for government, it was not explicit or, in my view, intended that a new racial equality strategy would be published, as such a strategy already exists and has not run the full term uh, to enact all of its commitments, which remains important today. Members will, however, be aware that the Executive had agreed at its meeting of the 17th of February a two-stage approach to the PFG. Firstly, preparation of an immediate outcomes-focused PFG to be ready by April 2020, and secondly, development of a new strategic uh, PFG reflecting agreed longer-term priorities to be ready by April 2021. In the weeks following that executive meeting, good progress had been achieved towards preparing uh, PFG 2021, and an intensive engagement process had been initiated to take the views of stakeholders ahead of the programme's planned publication in April. However, in mid-March, in light of the developing situation in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was decided that work on the PFG and NDNA should be temporarily paused. The changes brought about by that crisis and its impacts are, as we all know, uh, considerable. The Executive has therefore subsequently agreed a revised way forward on the programme for government. Firstly, an activity-based recovery programme is to be developed as the basis for driving economic health and societal recovery, which will continue for the rest of 2021. Secondly, a new outcomes-based strategic PFG is to be developed for the commencement uh, of April 2021, informed by citizen and stakeholder engagement and co-design. It will also have to reflect any executive decisions on the prioritisation of the actions in the NDNA document. However, we remain committed to our goal of full implementation of the racial equality strategy, which will continue to contribute to addressing key outcomes around equality and good relations. To say that the current strategy is outdated would suggest that those key actions set out and which we are currently progressing are no longer appropriate. While we understand and our officials have discussed with partners across the sector some frustrations with the speed of progress, we have not had feedback which would suggest the frustration is with the overall aims of the strategy or indeed uh, that those actions identified are no longer needed. I give way to Mr Stolford. I appreciate the Minister for giving way and he has touched upon the inherent problem. If you hit reset on this process, on this project, and you're going right back to first principles, right back to the very start, it may actually end up taking longer to secure the outcomes that you want. Before his intervention, and, and I absolutely agree, we do not want to go back to that um, starting point again, um, because people are waiting for this um, strategy to be um, implemented. Uh, and I just think that that would take a, a longer period of, of time. Not only that, but those in the sector are not calling for a new strategy. 
there's nothing wrong with the strategy that we have in terms of the outcomes that we all in this chamber have, have expressed that we share uh, today, uh, or how we go uh, about that. I think what people really want to see is an increase in the speed uh, in which those are, are to be uh, delivered. So the motion requests a commitment to act urgently on the forthcoming report on the review of hate crime legislation. This is not within the remit of my department, but is being taken forward uh, by Judge Desmond uh, Marinan on behalf of the Department of Justice. I understand he is currently analysing responses to his consultation and that DOJ expects to receive his final report at the end of November 2020. Any recommendations relating to devolved matters that require new legislation or amendments to current legislation will be considered and brought forward by DOJ in due course. The issue of an anti-racism ethos in our schools is being addressed by the Department of Education. The Addressing Bullying in Schools Act 2016 will require schools to record incidents of bullying, their motivation and their outcome, including racial bullying. The Minister of Education, Peter Weir, will announce commencement of the provisions of the Act in due course. In addition, key elements of the curriculum include mutual understanding, citizenship, cultural understanding and ethical awareness. Our schools have the freedom to use a variety of resources to introduce key concepts such as the impact of racism in society into many areas of learning. Uh, in fact, today, the first day of Good Relations Week, we will celebrate 14 more schools serving, serving urban village areas achieve the Schools uh, of Sanctuary uh, Award. As part of its work in tackling the enabling factors of hate crime, uh, DOJ has also commissioned SIA to review the primary and post-primary curriculum to gain an understanding of the teaching of topics which contribute to reducing hate crime and ensuring that issues such as racism are adequately addressed to increase understanding of diversity and the negative impact of prejudice-based uh, bullying. Uh, it is worth noting that the PSNI hate crime statistics indicate that there has been a decrease in race-motivated crimes and incidents in the last 12 months. However, we will not be uh, complacent. On the point of addressing both the contributions made by members of our ethnic minority communities and racism in general, I would like to once again reiterate that we have made it clear in previous answers and statements that racial inequality and good race relations is one of our key priorities. We recognise the need to continue our efforts across government and wider society to tackle racism and racial inequality, which has been brought into even sharper focus uh, by recent uh, events. We remain committed to the implementation of this strategy and welcome the ongoing support and advice uh, from the subgroup. Let me just finish, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, by saying that racism in any of its manifestations is an evil that can have no place here. We reiterate that today uh, and say that we have a zero tolerance approach to racism or discrimination of any kind. Thank you. I now call on Kelly Armstrong to wind on the amendment and you'll have five minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank all who have spoken here today. Um, we are hearing a unanimous voice coming forward from the Assembly that states very clearly this Good Relations Week that ra uh, racism is wrong. Racism has no part in our society. And I would like to thank Ms Sheeran for bringing forward the motion today. Um, it helps to focus our attention on the fact that we do have a number of issues with our existing um, racial equality strategy. Like many of you, I've spoken with members of the black and ethnic minority community and representative bodies, and they have indicated they do not wish the hard work that was completed in advance of the 2015 strategy to be wasted. What does need to happen is an effective implementation of the current strategy strategy which many of us around this chamber today have acknowledged not all of those recommendations have been carried out. So let's not delay by writing a new strategy. Our amendment has said that we want to see an update to that strategy, but we want to see an update of that strategy with the people who it most affects. And I appreciate that others have said here today a working group already exists. Having spoken to the BAME community, they will confirm that many of those people who are part of working groups are volunteers. Many of those people have lost funding for groups. Many of their employed members of staff no longer have jobs. So what we would like to do is to ensure that if we're going to include people's voices, that we include those people and ensure that they're supported 
to be able to take an effective part in looking at the update of the strategy. And it is right and proper. Any of us who have worked with strategies in the past, we recognise absolutely that part way through a strategy, you look back at what has been done and what needs to be done in order to see it fulfilled. We only have 18 months of this Assembly term left to go. If we wait until the end of that to see the rest of the recommendations implemented, they'll never happen. It's noted by the Equality Commission that the current strategy does have a few problems. It lacks outcome-based actions, and that does need to be reviewed. Actions should be designed to address inequalities experienced by people from minority ethnic communities in areas such as health and social care, education, housing, employment, and participation in public life. And that is why we go back to the amendment that we have made which calls on the First Minister and Deputy First Minister because while racial equality lies within the Executive Office, it will be that department that rules it out across all of our departments. All of our departments recognise the need to improve on racial equality in the work that they do and that's why they have champions. But those champions are hidden. We don't know who they are. We don't get reports on what they're doing and we would all like to see that happening as soon as possible. We also lack effective data recording to measure how effective measures are or where there are opportunities for improvements. As we all know, in order to access investment, you need to produce a fact-based business case. And unless we have appropriate data collection, this is impossible. If we are to have racial equality, then we need to address negative attitudes and ensure black, Asian and ethnic minorities are visible and voices are heard. As part of this Good Relations Week, we need to do more to ensure strategies are reviewed and updated to ensure they remain effective and still deliver an outcome. And was mentioned earlier by Ms Martina Anderson, one of the key ways that we could do that would be through, as she mentioned, teacher training for our schools. Of course we want to see better racial equality and training within or help within our schools for our pupils, but we need to start with the adults who are with them in their classes. And to be honest, that teacher training needs to be published so we can all see the content of that. In the disability community, we say nothing about us without us. The same must apply to the racial equality strategy. This room, as has been acknowledged, is white. I'm going to use my white privilege to say I don't know what it feels like to be a person who has black skin or who is from an ethnic minority in Northern Ireland today. They do, and they're the best voices to have input to that. BAME community must have an integral role in updating the current strategy, and we must take leadership by timetabling effective delivery of all the recommendations. Following on from the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact COVID has had, our society does need to do more to achieve better good relations for everyone. The timetabling is key. People don't want to hear about what we're going to do. They want to see a timetable when it's going to be done by. I ask that this Assembly supports the amendment and the motion. We have an opportunity to make a difference, and we have a short time left to do it. Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Gildenew to wind up the debate on the motion, and you'll have 10 minutes. Gormay Agat, last Kian Khorlia. Um, I rise today to support the motion, obviously, but also the amendment that has been brought mm -hmm. here today. And colleagues from across the House have highlighted the important areas that are in urgent need of reform to tackle institutional and structural racism that is evident here in the North. It's important, whilst having these discussions, to, to close with some reflection on the positive impact that migrants bring to our society and to highlight why they deserve better. And I suppose at this point I should declare an interest um, in, the, in the sense that we have heard from many representatives here from South Belfast today, but I represent South Tyrone and we too have a very vibrant and valued ethnic minority community, um, and indeed right across from Manor and South Tyrone and Mid-Ulster. In 2017, the migrant population of the North comprised of 138,000 people, a mere 7.5% of our population. With a total of 1.85 people living here in the north, 3.3% were born in the EU 26 nations and only 2.6 were from the rest of the world. Moreover, since the EU referendum, international inflows have decreased by 13%, while outflows fell by 7%. So this would suggest that this problem is linked to the Brexit campaign, which dubbed migrants as a problem and led to an increase in racist hate crimes. 
This is also evident in very significant shift in attitudes displayed in the North of Ireland Life and Times survey between 2013 and 2017. In 2017, out of a total of 835 workers, 83,000 were born outside of these islands. This accounts for 10% of the working population. Despite these relatively low numbers, when respondents in the Life and Time survey were asked their attitudes and asked the following question, um, whether the needs of migrant workers are putting a strain on schools, a worrying number of respondents agreed with the statement. 17% strongly agreed and 28% agreed. A total, I will. Would the member agree with me that we as leaders have a responsibility, as I said earlier, to, to, to remove that negative language and to ensure that people understand the value of these people and that they are not actually a drain on our resource but actually a benefit to our communities? I would ab absolutely agree with that. I have to say that uh, when, when I referenced um, the South Tyrone and, and my own background coming from an engineering company, um, in, the, in the early 90s and early 2000s, the, Tyrone and, and the South Tyrone engineering and food manufacturing sector are world leading in terms of their... But in that, in that 90s, when I was involved in an engineering business in, in South Tyrone, we were being constrained, not as, re, not as a result of economy or ideas or the ability to export, but by skilled work. And people came, but not only did they bring their skills and their diligence and their enthusiasm into the workplace, they brought a very deep and a rich culture with them as well. And I think we have benefited massively from all of that in our society. So we see these, these, these shifts within the attitude, and I think that needs to be absolutely a wake-up call to every one of us in this chamber. Recent and, in my view, shameful media reports have created a false narrative of a migrant invasion targeted at refugees. This narrative is used to create fear in the population that migrants are coming to take our jobs or take our benefits or take our houses or whatever it might be. A load of nonsense, to be quite honest. Um, that's an age-old playbook in terms of scapegoating migrants, scapegoating refugees for failures of the British government, for failures of service provision, and in some cases, their mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen that many of our skilled workers and frontline workers are migrants, and we are forever indebted to the work that they have done for us all in our health service, our shops, our factories, our delivery services, and indeed a range of other frontline services. Migrant workers are often recruited to workplaces in the north. Therefore, it's important to note their crucial contribution to our economy. Migration provides vital skills to our workforce and is estimated that minority ethnic enterprises contribute around £16 billion pounds per year to the economy across these islands. My own constituency of Dungannon is one of these areas that has benefited most from migration. In 2017, Dungannon had the largest proportion of overseas-born residents in the north. Workers come and staff our engineering companies, our meat plants, they add diversity to our schools and support businesses in the town. And I have to say, it would do your heart good to walk up through Dungannon Square on a Friday afternoon and to see the wide range and diversity of culture of young people from across the world interacting, bantering, engaging with each other, and indeed wearing sports tops from right across sports across our whole society and contributing in all those ways. However, despite the hard work of migrants, many workers are exploited for their labour receiving a smaller wage than local people for the same job and often working in very precarious conditions. This was evidenced in the recent outbreaks at local food processing factories right across this island and these islands where the workers tend to be majority migrants. As migrant workers are here on work visas or insecure status, they are afraid to speak up in case they may lose their job. It has also been referenced by my colleague Martina Anderson in relation to people being racially profiled, and this issue has been raised both in relation to the Black Lives Matter that Jerry Carroll has mentioned and in relation to transport. And there is no, re there is no uh, requirement for anyone from those areas to produce passports in this country uh, or across these islands. And we should not allow creeping racial profiling to, to come in here in, in terms of identifying people solely because of the colour of their skin. A recent UNITE survey has shown that 20% of the workforce at a COVID-19 impacted meat processing plant, 43% are migrants who live with two or more of their colleagues, and 11% live with five or more. An overwhelming majority of these said that they continued to work while sick as they could not afford to lose pay. 
And I think this raises the issue that we must, we must protect these workers as we protect everyone else. They are in need of additional consideration given their more precarious work and their multiple occupancy housing situations. However, when discussing these clusters, we rely heavily and indeed too heavily on data from elsewhere on these islands. And I note um, the, the acknowledgement that Gordon Lyons has made today in terms of the data, but I have to say I haven't seen anything to date uh, clear by way of evidence, but I think that is a huge gap. Um, so, as Emma pointed out, due to the lack of implementation of the racial equality strategy, there is actually li very little ethnic monitoring in workplaces at present, which will provide us with the information we need. We are also limited, and Gordon Lyons has referred to this, of, of how COVID-19 affects black and Asian minority ethnic communities in the North as a result of COVID. We are aware of the difficulties they have faced across the islands, but we do not, to my knowledge, have concrete uh, information and data yet, and that is an issue we must address quickly. So the same issue applies to the underreporting of crime, as mentioned by Linda Dillon earlier. We see an underreporting of crime. We see a reluctance from some of these communities to come forward and report crime in the first place. And I think that is something that we absolutely need to tackle. In the years since the Good Friday Agreement was signed, we have progressed into a much more open, accepting a multicultural society. Uh, since the violence ceased, migrants here feel safer to come and work and contribute to life here, and as a result, our communities uh, benefit from that contribution and the very rich diversity they bring. As Martina highlighted, with more migrant children in schools, it gives our young people the opportunity to learn about other cultures and languages that they may otherwise never learn. Early intervention against racism is key to halting the growth throughout our society. This will have a major impact on our children and young people uh, as they learn to be open-minded, tolerant, and creating a racism-free future. And I have to say, both my own lads, both uh, in primary and in secondary school, regularly talk about their friends who clearly come from other countries and benefit from that. And one of our members previously uh, stated the very important and relevant fact that no child, no child instinctively is racist or bears hatred. That's an attitude that's learned. So, one of the key components of the Black Lives Matter movement was the need for a broader education in schools. That includes a more comprehensive curriculum, including dealing with the skeletons from the colonial era and the long-term effects this has had on our society globally. Creating an anti-racism ethos in schools is key to assimilating black and Asian minority ethnic communities into our society as children alongside their peers. It is important to emphasise that those who are prejudiced and, and display prejudice are in the minority, but we cannot take that as a reason to be complacent. So finally, and I, and I apologise to members, I did not get around many of the very fine contributions that, that many of you made, but I think it is fair to say that this House is united in our view that we need to deal with this issue quickly and robustly, and I would like to thank the Council for Ethnic Minorities the African Caribbean Support Organisation and the North West Migrants Forum who have contributed to those bringing the debate here today and I wish to support the debate and the amendment. Coramayagov. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Paula Bradshaw and Kelly Armstrong be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Item 5 in the order of paper the adjournment. The question is the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. <laughs>